friends found themselves walking up a hill to meet him, which surprised them, as not long before then, he'd been dead. But Jesus was always surprising. They'd spent three years with him and seen him do so much. They'd seen him... Are you ready? <gasps> Kill the sick, the lame, and Simon's mother, eat with the people that no one else liked, raise people from the dead, care for children no one else thought were important, talk about the kingdom of God. 
calm a storm, feed thousands of people, twice. Walk on water, say he was the savior of the whole world. Warn he would suffer and die, go to Jerusalem, surrounded by large crowds. Curse of victory, teach a lot, kick out the temple merchants. Condemn the teachers of the law, say he would come back again, predict his betrayal, be arrested, heal an ear, be sentenced to death, get ridiculed, be nailed to a cross, killed and buried. <sighs> so, Jesus' friends hadn't expected to meet him again. But there he was. Jesus had risen from the dead. His friends and followers were amazed. They praised God and worshipped him, although some doubted. And Jesus said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I will be with you always to the end of the age. Jesus did all this for us, and now he has given us a job to do with the help of his Holy Spirit. So, are you ready? All right. So children, today you're going to see how Jesus ascended into heaven and how the Great Commission is our mission. All right, let's say that together. The Great Commission is our mission. You ready? Let's do it again. Ready? The Great Commission is our mission. That is what all children uh, are going to be learning about today. And uh, we're so glad that you're worshiping with us. Let's have a word of prayer for our children and they'll be dismissed. Lord, we just thank you for each child in our midst. Lord, those who are already in their classes and those who are about to head to their classes. Lord, we pray that you'd build into them. Lord, help them to see the value of your mission that you have e equipped us with and for. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, children, grades one through six, you may meet your adult leaders in the back. Head to the promised land, the lighthouse, and the rock. All right. And as our children are heading out this morning, uh, for all of our adults that are with us today, we want to say welcome. We're so glad that you're worshiping with us today. We trust this service will be a blessing to you and to your family. And uh, many of us, we do send out every single week, we do send out our New Life News and you get uh, our announcements there. But if you want a paper version, we've got a print off that is in the lobby so you can grab one on your way out the door. It's on all of the tables. It'll give you a little glimpse as to what's going on. Included in that is also a registration link. If you want to get plugged into our groups that are launching in just a few weeks, you'll want to be in on that. A lot of uh, adults are jumping into our men's groups and our women's groups. It'll be a lot of fun. You can request a friend, as we talked about last week, to be in a group with you. So it's going to be great. All right, so you'll want to do that. That's on the form. You'll see uh, our link for the children's camp. Uh, as well as the youth camp and Vacation Bible School. It's all on here, and it also comes in your email every week. But we're so glad that you're worshiping with us today. We trust that this service will be a blessing to you. Jake? Sing. We're going to continue to sing this morning. I search the world but it couldn't fill me And man's empty praise And treasures of fate Are never enough, no Oh, there's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing And nothing Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again.
guest with us this morning, Tyler and Pandora Mullen, newlyweds serving in the Air Force in Alaska. Raise your hands. Let's give them a nice new life appreciation. Thanks so much for attending. Great to see you. And thank you for your service to our country. May 19th, great day right here at New Life. We're going to, from 10 to 12, uh, 10 a.m. to noon, we're going to do Farmers to Families. We've linked up with the local food bank. It's going to be a great outreach. If you'd be available to help us, it's a Wednesday morning. We'd love to plug you in. We're going to have a great, great uh, outreach to our community, and we're looking forward to that. And then we just want to say also, we're so glad for everyone that joins us online. And let me say a word about our online ministry. So many folks join us, and we want to say we appreciate you being a part of, and being New Life members online. We thank God for you. This past Monday evening, I met a couple a few months ago. I preached a funeral, gave them a copy of Hope for the Heavy Heart. They're in another state, and but they started watching. They've been watching every Sunday uh, online with us, and we're so grateful for that. And Monday evening, they've had some physical challenges. Had the opportunity to call them on a conference call, speakerphone, if you will, and both of them reaffirmed, husband and wife, reaffirmed their faith in Christ personally Monday evening. Let's give the Lord the praise, shall we? You just never know what God's going to do. By the way, share these services with your Facebook friends. God will use it. 
You can give online, nlpositivefaith.com. You can mail it in, P.O. Box 228, Osceola, Indiana, 46561. Or we have the offering receptacles as you enter or leave the building. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your great power. You tell us your word will not return empty and void, but it will accomplish the very thing for which you send it forth to do. And Lord, we thank you that we know that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Lord, you tell us the grass withers, the flower fades away, but the word of our Lord endures forever. God, we pray that you would use your word, not only here at New Life, but all around the world as other preachers and missionaries share the love of Christ and the word of God. As we send our services to our Facebook friends, as our friends join us online each and every week, God, use your word. Multiply it beyond our wildest dreams. We'll give you the praise in Jesus' name.
And in a moment we shall be changed on that day. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. sing and shout the victory we'll sing and shout the victory amen what a powerful song what a powerful time of worship what a great reminder as we come together every week and that great reminder of that one day, one day that many of us are holding on to, that one day when we're reunited with our loved ones, that one day when everything, if our health is a challenge, when everything is made right, that one day, and we are looking forward to that one day, and until that time, we hang on to that hope. And so let's get in the Word of God this morning and see what He has for us today. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we come before You. Lord, we know that you have brought us all together from all walks of life, Lord, with many different things in our backgrounds, things going on in our lives, Lord. And so we just ask that each one of us, as we quiet our hearts, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us in a truly unique way. You know what each one of us needs to hear this morning. So, Lord, we ask that your word would speak to us today. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I was not a 90s child, I was a 90s teenager, but if you were a 90s child, you may remember this film. It's the 1998 Disney Pixar film, A Bug's Life. Do you have... Do we have that picture? Anybody seen that movie here? Anybody have a child uh, in the 2000s? And you, I mean, we still watched it in our home with our children. But this bug's life, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting story. And it's, a, a, it's an interesting thing where it starts off with these ants. And they're all working together. And they're all uh, contributing. They're grabbing uh, food. And they're gathering their food for the, during the harvest time. And they're preparing for winter. And then as well as preparing for their winter, they're also gathering food as an offering to the grasshoppers. Because if the grasshoppers uh, come and there's no platter of food for them, they will eat the ant's food and they will perish in the winter. And so there's, uh, there's Flick, the, uh, the, the ant who's telling the story about what happened. And all of a sudden, you know, you, you get these accounts that happen from year to year to year, how the grasshoppers come in, they just devour all the food and whoosh, they're off. One day Flick makes a mistake. Just before the grasshoppers come, he accidentally tips the leaf with their offering. It goes off the cliff into the water. And the grasshoppers all come in. They land. Where's the food? What's going on? Why isn't it here? It's supposed to be here. And they get so angry. Boom! They go down into the anthill. Let's see that next slide right there. Scares me just looking at it. Not this one. Do we have it? We don't have it. Yeah! Goodness gracious! Tried to watch this with our children. I didn't realize it could be so terrifying when they're three years old. Don't watch A Bug's Life if you have a child five and under, okay? Whoo, grasshoppers come in. Where's our food? And they give the ants a period of time. You gather our food or we take yours. And the ants decide after they leave, Flick helps them they to mount an attack to stand up to the grasshoppers but it's an amazing thing how even a place like disney can get it so right here are a group of ants who represent those who work those who contribute those who invest those who give of themselves those who contribute to the whole they are living with palms out what we would say at New Life, they are a giver. They're, they're not a taker. And then there's the grasshopper in life who is all about the take. 
What do you have next for me? I want this and I want this now. And they live palms in and they're selfish in their life. Even Disney gets it. Not only are there people like that in life, there are people like that as Christians. There are those who live with the palms out. They physically invest themselves in the Lord. They emotionally engage themselves with the Lord and His work and the work of Christians around them. They give of themselves to others around them. They financially invest in the things of the Lord. They spiritually involve themselves in what God is doing around them. And then there is also the grasshopper of a Christian. And they are consumers. And they come in and they descend in on a church. And they ravage everything within the church. And what else does this church have for me? And what else can I get out of this? And is there anything else you're offering? And they consume, 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 consume. And then boom, when there's nothing left. They fly away to another place. God does not want us to be consumers. In a a world of consumerism, in a world that is all about me, and what can I get, and what can you provide for me, and what are you going to do for me, and how are you going to make me feel better about what I'm doing, and how are you going to do the Lord's work for me, for me in my life how are you going to spoon feed me God's word every week how are you going to make me grow beyond what I actually want to do in my own life how are you going to supernaturally do these things that is not what God wants for us God wants for us as Christians to be like the ants God wants us to all contribute to all give to all be part of the work And just like we see in just a simple movie like A Bug's Life, when all are working together, great things happen. We pick up today in Jesus. He's had his breakfast with the disciples. He's risen. He's shown himself. He's taught by the sea. And now he is ascending to the Father. And he leaves this one last command for all of us he gave it to the disciples then to be carried out for the disciples of him throughout all throughout all of time if you have your bibles turn with me to matthew chapter 28 this morning matthew chapter 28 we're beginning to begin reading in verse 19 would you stand with me out of respect for the reading of god's word matthew chapter 28 let's begin reading in verse 18 jesus says this and jesus came and he spoke to them saying All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. You may be seated. If you're taking notes this morning, the power of a community on mission is what we're looking at today. The power of a community on mission. So when you take a look at the Great Commission and you see that as our mission as Christians, and what are we supposed to be doing? I'd encourage you to write down that number one, making disciples is better together. Making disciples is always better together. Making disciples, this is Jesus' last command to us. Go therefore into all the world. There is one command to make disciples... And there are three parts of this command. There are three things that are involved in making disciples of Jesus Christ. The first thing is to go. That means as you go into your life, as you go into your community, as you go into your world that you have been surrounded by, make disciples. And we as believers in Jesus Christ, as the New Testament church, We are to be intentional about going into our world that God has planted us within. So New Life Church, right here in the heart of Mishawaka, Osceola, Elkhart, and Granger. We are right here, planted here for the sake of making disciples here and responsible for helping get the, get the gospel and making disciples around the world, taking it to the whole world. One command, make disciples. Three parts. You are to go. 
baptize. Baptism is simply an outward display of an inward decision. Those who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, we follow the Lord in believer's baptism. It's the first command after trusting Christ as our Savior. So after we've trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we, we obey the Lord and we follow His lead and He says, be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that word baptism is where we get our, our, world, our word today of what you would call maybe marinate, the idea of soaking to baptize meat. Or in the clothing industry, uh, they would baptize, they would dunk a piece of clothing into a color to transform the color of that clothing. And what it does is it's a demonstration, it's an outward display of an inward decision that we have been transformed by Jesus Christ through our faith in Him. It's not what saves us, but it's, what, it's a communication to the world. I have been saved. I have trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. I am identifying with Him. Back then it was a huge deal. If you proclaimed Jesus as Lord and you identified with Jesus, you were denying the world powers at B. You were denying Caesar as Lord. You were saying Jesus is Lord. Throughout time, even in church history, as you read different accounts, people who were baptized, that chose to be baptized for their faith, could be killed for being baptized. A simple act of an outward display of an inward decision. Identifying with Jesus Christ. Make disciples. Help them trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Help them identify with Jesus Christ as their Savior. And then it says to teach them to observe all things that Jesus has commanded. And lo, he is with us always, even to the end of the age. So teaching, what are we supposed to be teaching? We teach the Word of God. You see, the Gospels tell us all about the life of Christ, our Lord, the one that we believe in, the one that we've identified with. The Gospels tell us all about Him, about how He lived, about what He did, about the miracles on this earth, just like the children's video that we saw today, all the miracles. I mean, it's amazing. Jesus' teachings while He was here. Acts gives us the account of the early church, of when the church was born, and how the Holy Spirit supernaturally worked through the, the disciples who became apostles after Jesus ascended to heaven, and how the New Testament church was born, and boom, the gospel got out to the world. And it, said, it says in Acts that these are the ones who have turned the, the world, not their world, but the world, upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Pauline epistles, those are epistles that were written to churches that were planted all around the region these were gentile churches people who had just trusted jesus christ their savior and there was, there's instruction on how to be a church how to be a believer then there are the pastoral epistles those are how to lead and how to govern the new testament church then you have revelation that gives us a glimpse of when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be. I won't sing. That's Jake does a better job than I do. You see, God wants us to be intentional about our mission. He wants us to be intentional about what he has entrusted us with. But make no mistake about it. When we become intentional about the work of Jesus Christ, it is not an easy task. In fact, when you start thinking about the Great Commission, it is daunting for any individual. It becomes almost like a point of like, wow, I'm not sure I can actually do it. When I start actually thinking about engaging in the work of the gospel in my life, if I start thinking about taking the gospel to the world, oh my goodness, how do I do this? I want to be part of the work of Christ. I want him to be glorified and honored in my life, but how, how do I do this by myself? You see, in American Christianity, we become so, so me-centered. And it's almost the American dream that gets infiltrated in with our understanding of scripture but this wasn't given to an individual this command was given to the disciples this was given to a group this was given to to a, a base of people that were commanded to take it together and get that gospel to the world i think the work of the lord is so much better when we do it together it's so much better when we engage in the work together. 
You know, 82% of all people who walk through the doors of any church, they do so at the personal invitation of a friend. God wants us to be intentional individually, and He wants us to be intentional collectively as a group. One of the visions that I have for our groups that we're launching in just a few weeks is the concept of making disciples together. Better together. Doing it together. Instead of individually, why not together? What if we became intentional about the way we serve the Lord? What if groups took on the project with a local food bank and helped distribute on behalf of New Life, but more importantly, on behalf of the Lord, food to our community? What if a group chose a local nursing home where people have been isolated for so long in the middle of a pandemic, and when we're able to get back in, and maybe vaccinations have happened in, in, their, in their midst, and they're able to start having visitors again. Can you imagine what would happen if a community group said, we're going to go in, and we're going to play checkers, we're going to play chess, we're going to enjoy some time with some seniors who are so lonely, and this year has been so hard. And they did so, but they did so to share Christ. Can you imagine what would happen if a, a, a community group took on uh, a local cleanup of a baseball park who is hurting for volunteers because all of these local parks, they're running on volunteers. And volunteerism is very shorthanded in today's society that's saying, well, why don't you just do it for me? And what if we showed up and we just said, hey, we're going to clean up your ballpark for you. We just want you to, we don't want to be, pu- we don't want to make it public or anything. We just want you to know new life is your friend and we care about your ballpark and instilling character into the lives of these children that you coach every single week. Can you imagine what would happen if a community group joined together and they said, you know what? We're so, we value our local parks here in the community so much that, you know what? What if we just said, hey, we're going to take on uh, Twin Branch Park and hey, we're gonna, it's right down the street from our church here. We want to just pour a few hours in on a Saturday and we want to show Christ. We want to just clean up as best as we can. You see, these are tasks that actually show Christ to our community. But if we just do the task without the mission, we don't actually make disciples. Making disciples is about doing the task with the purpose of being able to share Christ with others. If we take food to the world, but we never share Christ, we fed them for a moment and we've left them lost for eternity. But if we take the gospel to the world and we leave their basic needs ignored, we've helped them understand Christ, but we've ignored their present reality. There has to be a balance. We've got to work together on bringing a balance of meeting the present need, but with the purpose of the gospel, not leaving either one out. Groups, our groups, I believe, when you get engaged, I believe that we can fulfill the the purpose of the Great Commission in an even better way. It's about not saying, what can I consume from this group, but how can I contribute to this group? How can I contribute to the work of the Lord at New Life? How can I contribute? I want to be an ant. I don't want to be a grasshopper. Young grasshopper. I'd encourage you to write down. Number two, paying the price for discipleship is better together. Paying the price for discipleship is better together. This is not something that is popular in American Christianity. You don't often hear Luke 9, 23 read. In fact, if you have your Bibles, you're welcome to join me there. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, I'm going to read it. And it's Jesus doing the talking here. And this is not a popular saying amongst trusting Christ as Savior in America. This isn't. But it's true, we need to know this. Jesus says this in Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Whew. The price of discipleship. There will be crosses that we will carry 
all of our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. Jesus carried his cross, and we will carry ours. I don't know what that cross will be for you, but I do know that the disciples who he was speaking to in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23 here, some of them would lose their jobs. Some of them would lose their finances. Some of them were going to lose their freedom. Some of them were going to lose their families, as crazy as that sounds. They were going to lose their families. Some of them were going to actually, actually most of them were going to lose their lives. They were going to actually become martyrs. They would be murdered for the sake of Jesus Christ. They would be told to recant what they had said and what they had preached and what they believed. And when they refused to do so, they would be killed. Peter would be crucified upside down. John was going to be attempted to be murdered by being thrown in a pot of boiling oil. I mean, it it was brutal what they did to these men. Paul was beheaded. There was a cost for following Jesus Christ. The disciples paid that price. And I think they paid the price not easier, but I believe they paid the price in a way that was more achievable because they knew each other were in it with them. I think when you're paying your price for discipleship to follow Jesus Christ as your Savior, it is better when we do it together. The assignment that we are taking on to make disciples here in our community and around the world for Jesus Christ, it's going to take time. It's going to take energy. Physically speaking, it's going to take, it's going to take a toll on you. There will be time that you invest. There will be energy that you will invest. Emotionally, you will pay a toll because you will be engaging in a mission. You're not just going through with the motions. You're actually engaged. You're actually almost as if you were cheering for your favorite ball team on the baseball or on TV and you're watching with intent and excitement. Sometimes when you finish watching a ball game, even though you haven't left your couch, you feel tired because you're engaged in it. Sometimes you're pacing, man, what are we going to do? Come on, 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 come on. You're just, you're engaged in the mission. That's how we are to be with the mission of the gospel. We're supposed to be in it. When people trust Jesus Christ as your savior, we jump up. We're like, yes, we got a score. Woo, touchdown. I can see it on your faces. That's how you feel, isn't it? When someone gets baptized, we're like, yes, score one for the team of Christ. got to get into it i enjoy coaching our girls in soccer i leave the field more tired than they do even though they do all the running because i'm engaged right emotionally spiritually we must physically engage in the mission we must financially engage in the mission it must be an all-encompassing i'm all in lord i want to be in on this And when we do that and we begin paying the price for the discipleship in our lives and the Lord transforming our hearts and shaping our lives, there's a lot of different ways the Lord shapes our lives. There's a lot of different ways the enemy comes at us. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us we don't wrestle against um, flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities of darkness. You know what? The reality is is Satan does not want you engaged in anything that has to do with the Lord. So he's going to try to take you down. He's going to discourage you. He's going to try to pull you down. He's going to try to get into your family life. He's going to try to destroy your family. He's going to try to destroy your friendships. He's going to try to bring you down. And so when Satan is trying to bring you down, what is the best thing that you can do? Have believers around you. It's amazing how just a four-year period of your life can be so marking. Many of us can remember high school days. I mean, it's just like it's... It's four years. Now four years just like blinking. It's like gone, right? Four years. I I just, I'll never forget being in the middle of wrestling practice. And I'm not discrediting any other sport. I'm sure every other sport has their times where things were incredibly intense. And I, but I, but in wrestling there, there, there were these practices that we would go through and you'd be wearing like the, they call them sauna suits. Like they were like rubber suits to kind of trap the water. They're illegal today, but I'm going back to the nineties. And uh, we have like multiple sweatshirts on and sweats. And we're just, just 
being destroyed in this room. Being pushed beyond anything we ever thought we could do physically. Mentally pushed beyond anything we thought we were capable of. So much so that when I was in college, and I, I pulled all-nighters all the time, writing papers and stuff, I, I wrote our coach. I just said, thank you for pushing us beyond anything I thought we were cap- I was capable of doing because now I believe I'm doing something I didn't think I was capable of doing because I was pushed so hard in high school to do something I didn't think I was capable of doing. Coaches, believe in what you're doing. But there was this moment in those hard practices where you're drilling, you're doing sprints, and you're running, and you're just, you're, you're exhausted. And you look up, and you see others, the other guys in the room, and they're still going. And you say, I can keep going. And you go another round, and you don't think you have it in you, and you get done, and you're kneeling on the mat, and you look up, and other guys are drenched in sweat, and they're breathing heavy. They're still going. You know you can still keep going. So you go another round, and another round, and you just keep going, and you don't quit. And finally, sure enough, practice ends something you didn't think you'd be able to complete you do complete because others around you are doing that i believe that one of the values of godly groups one of the values of the local church is putting around you people in your life there is going to come a point in time if you follow jesus christ if you follow him wholeheartedly there will come a point in your life where you literally say, I don't know if I can go on. I don't know if I have it in me. I don't, I'm empty, Lord. I don't have it. And that's when the Holy Spirit takes over. And you find out it's not you who finishes your race. It's the Holy Spirit that empowers you to finish your race. And it's at that moment in time where you need to be able to look up and see the believers around you. They're still going. They're still going. They've been through hardship. They've been through hardship. They've been through hardship. I can go through hardship. They've battled this. They've battled this. They've battled this. I can keep going. I can battle. Paying the price for discipleship is always better when we do it together. That's the power of being plugged in to a group that is on mission. That's the power of being plugged into a church that is on mission. That's the power of engaging in a world what Christ wants for us individually to do it collectively. Well, if you're taking notes this morning, I'd encourage you to write down. Our mission is bigger than any one person, group, or church. We are certainly at New Life not here to tell you this is the only church in town, the only church in our state, the only church in the country, the only church in the world. But we are the church here. The mission of Jesus Christ is for every church. The mission of Jesus Christ is to be, to be engaged by every Christian in every church. But the mission is so much bigger than any one person, any one group, or any one church. In fact, I, I love the words, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse 6, he says, I planted, he planted the seed of the gospel, Apollos watered the seed of the gospel, but ultimately it's God who gives the, the increase. And so when you're engaging in a mission, in the mission of, of the gospel for Jesus Christ, you're making disciples, you just trust that God's at work around you. And so you plant the seed of the gospel. You might meet somebody who's had the seed of the gospel planted in their life and they haven't made, taken the step to believe in Jesus Christ or Savior. They're, that's okay to you. You just keep watering it. You just keep watering it and praying for that individual. And then eventually, somewhere along the line, that person may trust Jesus Christ your sa- as their Savior. And you just say, man, to God be the glory. I know they planted. I helped water over here. But to God be the glory because he's the one that gave the increase. That's when that person trusted Christ as their Savior. You just trust that God's at work around you. You believe in it. I planted a polished water, but God gave the increase. But there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different ministries in our world. 
Augustine said it this way. He said, in the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty. But in all things, charity. Or in all things, grace. There's a lot of different churches, but we must be united on the gospel. We must be united on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins. And that being the only way to God the Father. We must be united on the deity of Jesus Christ. We must be united on some certain key essentials. And then there's some non-essentials. Some ways of which to go about things. And you know what? Some churches, that boy, they have... They have this ministry and it's wonderful. This church has this ministry and that's wonderful. This church has this ministry. That's wonderful. That's okay. That's their way of going about some different things. And you know what? We cheer them on. We applaud them because everything's a little different. In the essentials, we're unified. In the non-essentials, hey, there's liberty. But in all things, we're going to be gracious. It may not be the way we prefer it, but hey, God's using it. New life. We recognize this is our niche in our community. We recognize that we, we value dynamic and biblical godly worship. The preaching of God's word unashamedly. Taking the text at face value. We have a high view of scripture. We value what the Bible has to say. And we take a high view of scripture. We don't downplay scripture. We lift it up. It is our authority. That's what we want to be known for. We have a high energy children's ministry that is biblical. Man, children are memorizing verses. They're learning foundations for life. We put that in intentionally. Our student ministry is geared towards producing leaders, Christian leaders, that when they graduate, they become influential in the local church that they join. We want to be a friend to the community. We want to be known as someone in the community, as a church in the community that cares about the community, that is a friend to the community. We value groups here. We are strong in our mission. The Great Commission is our mission, as we said already. The Great Commission is our mission. And we have a love for all people, and we are known as a place that believes the gospel is for all people. We recognize our niche. We embrace this assignment from the Lord. And it's the intention of our groups to help our ministry fulfill its niche in our community. If you're taking notes this morning, I encourage you to write down number four. Success in our mission requires a team effort. Success in our mission requires a team effort. If you have your Bible, I'm going to turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. I'd encourage you to join me. Ephesians chapter 4. Success in our mission requires a team effort. What, is, what do we mean by that? Well, Ephesians chapter 4 gives some instruction to the church. Remember, it's a Pauline epistle. And he's instructing the Christians in Ephesus. Here's how to live for the Lord. Here's how to be a great church for the Lord. In verse 11, he says, Christ gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For what? For the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Jesus Christ from whom the whole body is joined and knit together by, whatever, by, by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share and it causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. When every part of the body of Jesus Christ does its part, it causes growth. It causes growth for the individuals within that body. It causes growth because people are trusting Jesus Christ as their Savior. But I want you to think about it like this. Now, he mentioned several different gifts here. I, I want to read a few different spiritual gifts. The moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, we're all given a measure of spiritual gifts. Let me share with you some of these different spiritual gifts. All right, there's the gift of administration. Those who can organize and uh, uh, do multiple tasks. Um, there's the gift of apostleship. The ability to pioneer new churches and ministries. The gift of craftsmanship. Um, the ability to plan, build, and work with your hands. The gift of discernment. The spiritually identify falsehood and distinguish between right and wrong motives, sometimes in other people. The gift of evangelism, 
uh, to help non-Christians take the necessary steps to become born-again Christians. The gift of exhortation to comfort or to urge others to take action through written or spoken word through biblical truth. There's the gift of faith to believe in God for unseen supernatural results in every area of life. The gift of giving, the ability to produce wealth and to give well above uh, 10% of your tithes and your offerings for the purpose of advancing the kingdom on earth. The gift of healing to act as an inter intermediary uh, in faith, prayer, and in the laying on of hands. There is the gift of helps. This is someone who is able to work in a supportive role for the accomplishment of the tasks in Christian ministry. The gift of hospitality to create warm, welcoming environments uh, for others in places like your home or office or even within the church to make people feel at home. The gift of intercession to stand in the gap uh, and pray for someone or something in some place. The word of knowledge to bring truth to a situation by supernatural revelation. The gift of leadership to influence people at their level while directing and focusing them on the big picture. The gift of mercy to feel empathy and to care for those who are hurting in some way. The gift of miracles, the ability to alter the natural outcomes of life in a supernatural way through prayer and faith. The gift of pastor or shepherd to care for others' personal needs. Um, uh, by nurturing and mending life issues. The gift of prophecy to communicate God's truth to the heart in a way that compels people to have a right relationship with the Lord. The gift of service, the ability to do small and great tasks in working for the overall good of the body of Christ. The gift of teaching, to study and to learn from scriptures and to bring an understanding and a depth to uh, that, that certain issue. The gift of tongues, to pray um, in a language that is not your own, that can be interpreted by others, uh, that are sitting in your midst that cannot understand that. The gift of the word of wisdom, the ability to understand and bring clarity to situations and circumstances, often through applying truths of Scripture. These are just a few, if not many, of spiritual gifts. No one person can, can do all of that. Now you see why Jesus speaking to his disciples and it wasn't just 12 he was speaking to his 12 but he was also speaking to there was 120 that followed him and then a multitude jesus gave his instruction because the holy spirit was going to use each and every one of them in a powerful way for his mission his mission god's not pleased when one person does it all the work of the ministry is not for one pastor, or one deacon, or any, any one spiritual leader. The gift of the, uh, the work of the ministry is for the whole, for everybody together. In fact, it's estimated in churches that 80% of all of the work in a local church is done by 20% of the people. I don't believe that is the case here at New Life because we, are, we, we have a, a group that is very heavily involved in our mission. We value that. But God did not create us to be mere consumers. He didn't create us to be the grasshoppers who descend in on a church and ravage that church and take everything that we can out of that church and then say, I think the Lord's moving me on. There's nothing here more for me. That says more about you than it does about the church. When you hear that statement, it says more about the person than it does about the church. God wants us to be the ant who is constantly at work, shouldering the load, doing their part, fulfilling their mission. God created the church to function as a body, Jesus Christ as the head. You know, a good team is going to beat an individual any time of the week, any day. One of the things we're building into our groups is not one group leader as an ant and five consumers of the group. Some of you are like, oh no, I already signed up for my group. Do not tell me I have to work in my group. One of the things we're building into our groups is everyone's going to have a role to play because we all want to contribute. Maybe it's going to be your role to uh, plan a place where everybody's going to meet. We're going to meet at Starbucks on the corner of Bittersweet and Lincoln Way. We have to eat out, we have to drink outdoors though because their insides are still closed. 
All right, so we're going to sit on the outdoor seating and we're all going to uh, have our coffee. That's where we're going to meet for our group. Maybe it's going to be your role to coordinate um, a prayer request. So after everybody shares, you're jotting them down. You punch them into your group text message real quick and you send that out. It's just a simple way to contribute to your group. Maybe it's going to be your role to book a tea time for your group and your fellowship event and you're going to coordinate uh, down at Everhart and you're going to get two tea times side by side. And you're going to say, hey guys, when we're all done, we're going to have a sandwich there at the pro shop and uh, we're going to have some fellowship there. It's going to be a great day and make sure you can make it. Maybe it's going to be whatever it is, just know that it's not going to be big, but it's going to be something. It's going to be something that Every single person is a contributor within their group. Because I believe that God wants every one of us to not just consume, He wants us to contribute. Finally, I encourage you to write down a community fulfilling its mission brings glory to God. A community fulfilling its mission brings glory to God. We've been all around the New Testament a little bit today. We're going to go to one more place. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to read out of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's your reasonable service. When we lay down our personal preferences to pick up the assignment from God in our lives, we become like a sacrifice. The Bible says like a sweet-smelling aroma. Just like in the Old Testament when they would sacrifice an animal, the Lord called it a sweet-smelling aroma rising into the heavens. You know, we don't have those sacrifices anymore because Jesus became the eternal sacrifice And so as a result of Jesus becoming the eternal sacrifice, you and I, when we live our lives in obedience to the Lord, we become a sweet-smelling aroma to Him. Sacrificial living. Staying on mission. New life is a church on mission. And I believe that a community on mission, when it fulfills its mission, brings glory to God. So you might think of it like this. New life brings glory to God when one person trusts Christ as their Savior. And when you think about one person trusting Christ as their Savior, think about what all went into that. Think about the hours of witnessing by those who cared for that person to witness. Think about the personal invitation. Would you come with me to church? Would you just come with us? Would you sit with me? we'll, We'll save you a seat. There's social distancing. New life's got plenty of seats. Think of the, as they walk in, the warm entrance, people opening doors for them, saying, welcome, it's so good to have you here. We're so glad you're here. Think of when they check their children into the children's ministry and that warm welcome at the counter, and they smile and they say, we're so glad you're here. And then that warm uh, welcome to the children as they get dropped off in their classes, and the reassurement that they're going to be okay, and we're going to build a foundation in their life, and we care about your children just like you do. And then they come in and they sit in and they experience a a godly worship service where the music is Christ-centered and it's full of rich theology. And then they hear the preaching of God's Word and they hear the gospel shared again in a way that really truly ministers to their heart. And they trust Christ as their Savior. And then they hear, they have the follow-up of a friend who had been witnessing to them all along. And they have that deep conversation with them where they're able to share about what it truly means to be a Christian and the decision that you made. And then they're able to see uh, someone get them introduced to the pastor so they can actually have a, a time where they sit down and they talk about what is baptism. And then they're able, to, they're able to talk about, hey, you know what, I think I want to take that step in my life. And so they take that step and they, they trust Christ. They've already trusted Christ and they follow the Lord and believers' baptism. And then there's that part of getting involved in a group, which isn't easy. And so then there's that inclusiveness, not exclusiveness, inclusiveness, saying we're so glad that you're here. Man, we're a place for everybody. Everybody has a place here at New Life. One changed life is touched by hundreds of people in this place. One changed life. We bring glory to God. New life brings glory to God when we all fulfill our part knowing he's at work in the lives of those around us. New life brings glory to God 
when someone learns how to live for Christ through his word. New life brings glory to God when there's unity of the body of Christ. New life brings glory to God when there is a support of the biblical authority in the church. New life brings glory to God when there's love for one another within the church. New life brings glory to God when there's care for one another in the church. New life brings glory to God when this church becomes an equipping center on Sunday so that we can become the church on Monday through Saturday out there. That is what God designed the church to be. Equipping here, worshiping here, learning from God here, and then going out there and being the church. That is when God is glorified. So I want to put that final picture up. Let's go to that last slide. We got Flick, the ants, and we've got Hopper. The grasshopper. I must ask, you know, one represents the builder, the gatherer, and the contributor. The other represents the destroyer, the taker, the selfish. Which one describes you? Which one? The beauty of Jesus Christ is you don't have to stay as that one. Hopefully it's the ant. But if you take a step back in self-reflection, you say, man, I got to tell you, Michael, I'm a grasshopper. I didn't want to be, but I am. God can change your heart. You can become that contributor. God desires that we all become like that ant. Build, gather, contribute to kingdom work. And that's what our groups are going to be designed to do. So on your way out, I'd encourage you, you can either go to nlpositivefaith.com forward slash groups. You can grab this piece of paper on your way out the door. It's got it right there on there for you. You can go online. You can take a look at, we've posted the link for groups online. We've sent it out in the email. You want to get into these groups. You know, some of you heard me say last week, right now you all want to be in one. You're 100% sure I need to be in this group. By the time you got to the car, it got cut in half. By the time you got home, got cut in half again. By the time that evening rolled around, cut in half again. By the time you woke up the next morning, cut in half again. By the time Monday night rolled around, you're like, eh, I don't need it. Some of you are living proof, aren't you? Pastor Michael, I got all the way home. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think I needed it by Monday. Get in a group. You'll be so glad you did. That's what our groups are going to be focused on. They're going to be focused on mission. They're going to be focused on purpose. They're going to be focused on doing the work of God right here and all around our community. God's going to bless your life and he's going to bless other lives through your involvement in their lives. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around, maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ is your Savior. We do not want you to leave today without knowing for sure where you stand with the Lord. Would you go to him in prayer this morning? Say, dear Jesus, I believe in you as the eternal son of the living God who died on the cross and rose from the dead for my sins. Would you come into my life and save me? Believing, friend. You're praying about it. You're thinking about it. Ask the Lord to give you wisdom, give you discernment. To help you take that step in your life to say, Lord, I need other people around me. I can't do this on my own. Ask Him to give you the courage to involve yourself with a group on mission. Maybe you find yourself saying, man, I've been been consuming a lot in life. I want to be a giver. I want to give of myself, not take from others. Ask the Lord to open your eyes to times in your life, times throughout the day where you can be a giver not a taker. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your command, your your last commission to us, Lord. May it be the most important mission that we involve ourselves in our lives. Lord, we pray for our church. We pray for our midst as we are beginning something new. Lord, I pray that you would bless our church, bless our community. Lord, I pray that you bless every single life that is present in our midst through what we are beginning. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us today as we conclude our service? The great I am. The great I am. Let's sing. Hallelujah. Holy, holy God Almighty. The great I am. Who is worthy? None beside. God Almighty, the great I am, the great I am, the mountains shake, the mountains shake me 
may be seated just for a moment. We want to introduce to you, this is Vitaly and Christina Nadiak, and uh, this is their little girl, Ivanka. And many of you remember when we prayed two months ago for Ivanka, she was born premature, and uh, both Vitaly and Christina, they've been through our Next Step seminar. They came to that Next Step seminar, and then they went into labor that week. And so uh, they're, they're excited to make New Life their church home. But it's so great to see Ivanka, who we prayed for. She's doing so well uh, today, two months later. God's been good. Let's give it up for the Lord and what he's done. And uh, Vitaly um, and Christina, they both uh, trusted Christ as their Savior. They've been baptized uh, by immersion. Um, they love the Lord. They've gone through our Next Step seminar. They desire to make New Life their church home. And uh, if you're in favor of that, would you raise your right hand and give us a big amen this morning? Amen. Well, we want to welcome you to New Life. And um, like we said last week, we, you know, with, with COVID, we're not going to do the right hand of fellowship. But uh, Rudy's going to take uh, Vitaly and Christina to the lobby. Would you give, us, give them the right wave of welcome as you leave this morning? And just welcome them to our midst. It's so good to have them as part of our church. Um, Rudy's going to take you guys out this morning. Would you stand with us as we conclude in prayer this morning? And uh, this morning we're going to we're going to pray this great benediction together. It's on the screen in front of you. Would you go to the Lord in prayer with me? Let's pray together. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone who is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be dismissed this morning. Amen.